Jesus was born in a manger as a baby. The incarnation of God. He came with a mission. The Spirit of God was upon him. He proclaimed good news to the poor. He bound up the brokenhearted. He proclaimed freedom for the captive. He released prisoners from darkness. His life led to his death on a cross. It is finished, he proclaimed upon his death. His mission was accomplished. He was the sacrifice for all humankind. And he is alive today. Praise the Lord, saints. We greet you this morning, the Resurrection Sunday, the time that our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We greet you in his name, because if you're here and you're under the sound of my voice, we know that you made it. Jesus was faithful to his word because he'll let you get up and see another day. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want to show you something from the book of Luke, chapter 24. The Bible reads as follows. Now, on the first day of the week, early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they, were, they went in and did not find the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in, the sh in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still with you in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Amen. I want to talk to you on this thought. What happened to Jesus? What happened to him? Well, let's give you some facts first. The Bible says that the Jewish Sabbath, uh, our Saturday, is the last day of the week. This day commemorates the day of rest when Jesus rested from creation. However, the Bible says the Christian Sunday is the first day of the week and commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the first Christian Sunday, the women went into the tomb to carry out the ritual, the last acts of love, and embalmed the body of Jesus with their spices. So we see they are gone, they've gone to the tomb. They are prepared to embalm the body. Now, if you uh, read a little further, you'll find in Luke chapter 23, they had already taken the body. They had the, the spices and what have you, but they weren't able to get to the body. So the Bible says that uh, <clears throat> they were hoping to finish what they had started the day before. And the Bible says that it was early in the morning. One translation says it was still dark. So the Bible says that they, their main concern, and sometimes we're one track, their main concern was who was going to roll away the stone. Now, probably they had a discussion before they got there. What do we do when we get there if the stone is still intact? Do we talk to the guards and maybe get them to try to remove the stone? Or we, we don't know what we're going to do. But somebody always says it this way, but God. But God was faithful in that he had already removed the stone. The stone was out of place because the angels had moved the stone. Matthew says there was an earthquake and the earthquake moved the stone away. Now, the first thing that we notice is that when the stone was removed, 
They looked in and there was no Jesus. The question then was, where is Jesus? What happened to Jesus? Well, this is the essence of the Easter message, the sunrise message. There was no Jesus. He was not there. He was gone. So according to Matthew 28, verses 6 and 7, the Easter message is this. Come see and go tell. Come see. The tomb is empty. And then go tell everyone else that that tomb is no longer occupied. So we see now that they were sad, they were confused, they were bewildered, and they were wondering what happened to Jesus. Well, let me give you three things that happened with this encounter. First is this. The Bible says they were perplexed. I use the term bewildered. The women's souls were depressed. They were exhausted. They were mourning. There was no hope whatsoever. And according to Mark, they were fretting over how they would get into the tomb. They did not expect anything more than more sorrow when they got there. Now, in, in our, <clears throat> our particular time here in our contemporary America, if we take flowers to the grave, then there is an expectation when we get to the cemetery that we will not see an empty grave. Now, Jesus was gone. When they got there, they had an expectation, but it was that he was still in the grave. But the Bible said that he was gone. So when the women went into the tomb, they found the stone rolled away. But when they entered and not found in the body, they were confused now. And they said, uh, apparently, someone has stolen the body. Now, according to John chapter 20, verse 2, this is what uh, they believed that somebody had, had taken the body. Now, the Bible goes on to tell us that as they went, there were, uh, women were puzzled over what had happened, suddenly they realized they were not alone. It was now they had a realization that there was an angel there. And according to verse 4 of Matthew 24, the Bible says that these people who were there were angels. Now, the Bible is very clear that the second part of this, we said the first was they were bewildered, is that they were rebuked. The Bible says that the presence of angels changes everything. The Bible says that, it, that when they looked, they saw the splendor of these angels. And the Bible says in uh, Luke chapter 9, 29, it says the appearance was altered and they were as white and glistening. But the women were overcome with fear and they bowed until their faces were on the ground. And as a sign of respect, the Bible says while they were bowing, the angels began to speak and they gave what we call the immortal rebuke. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why were they coming to anoint a lifeless Jesus? When they should have known that he would rise from the dead, the angel said it was shameful for them to look for Jesus in the grave. Now, if you're looking for a dead relative, you go to the grave because he should be among the dead. But if you're looking for a living savior, then you've got it all wrong. You just missed the boat. The Bible says that all resurrection denying churches look for Jesus among the dead. Now, you know what I'm talking about when I say non-resurrection churches. These are churches who have the emblems all around. They show you Jesus still on the cross because they believe that he is still a dead savior. So they tell you that he was a courageous man. They tell you that he was a man of great conviction. They tell you he was even a man of great faith, but they still believe that he's dead. Now, these churches will never, ever minister what we call the R word, resurrection. Now, that brings us to the third point. The Bible says that they were instructed after they were 
in a state of bewilderment after they had been rebuked. Why are you here if you didn't hear what he said about getting up? You didn't believe him. Why are you here? So they were now instructed. Verses six through eight tells us this. The rebuke set the stage for the angel's proclamation of a joyous Easter message. He is not here. He is risen. Or more accurately, he has been raised. Now, if we look in the book of Acts, it's very clear who raised him. I know a lot of people, Jesus got up on his own. That's not what the Bible teaches. Here's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. Then in Acts 4.10, the Bible says, let it be known to you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. So it was an act of God to raise his only son. Amen. Now, then the Bible says that we have been told time and time again what he was going to do, that he was going to raise, be raised from the dead. So the Bible says that when uh, he spoke to them, the angels spoke to them, I'm sorry, the angels spoke to them. They realize now in hearing the words, he says, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, but must be crucified on the third day and rise again. Then they remembered his words. The angel challenged them to remember the prophecies of his passion. Now let's look at Luke chapter nine, verse 22 saying the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests, scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Matthew 16, 21 says from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Also, the Bible says that after the transfiguration, he said the son of man was going to be betrayed into the hands of evil men. They will kill him. And after three days, he would rise. Amen. Now, notice this. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 22, it says, now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be betrayed in the hands of evil men and they will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Amen. So the Bible goes on to tell us that the women now remembered Jesus's words. Jesus had often spoke metaphorically, but sometimes people don't get the metaphor. A lot of times they're looking for the literal translation and they miss the object of the story. But now the light had begun to come on and now they knew immediately that he had risen. So the great truth here is that the significance of the resurrection is inseparable from Jesus's prophetic word about his death and resurrection. It is the word of God that makes sense out of everything. Uh, significantly, all three episodes here are constructed the same way uh, so that bewilderment, rebuke, and instruction are always the case. We're always amazed about what we hear about Jesus. And because we don't believe what we hear, there's a rebuke that comes. And then we have to be instructed in the word. The Bible says the instruction section consists of a call to remember what God said. Now, I tell you, no matter how old you are and how long you live, you're going to have a moment when you remember what he said to you. Now, people will always tell you, I, I, I never heard that before. I don't believe that. Tr trust me, you will remember what he said. Now, the Bible teaches us that people who hear about the resurrection for the first time might need to pass through what we call the four stages of belief. Let me give them to you. The first one, the Bible says, is we may think it's a fairy tale or we make it an impossible thing to believe. 
So we don't believe it at all. That's the bewilderment stage. Like Peter, the second thing is, uh, we see is they have to check out the facts. It's amazing how saints have to check out the facts in order to operate in faith. But they still be puzzled about what happened. So that brings us to the third uh, step in belief. Only when we encounter Jesus personally will, be able, will we be able to accept or make a decision about the fact of the resurrection. Every one of us will have a personal encounter with Jesus. Whether you believe that or not, if you haven't had one, your time is coming. If you had it, you know what I'm talking about. But the fourth uh, uh, statement of belief is this. As we commit ourselves to Jesus and devote our lives to serving him, we will begin to fully understand the reality of his presence. So what does that mean? That means the more time I spend with Jesus, the closer I get to him and the more I understand him. The more I understand him, the more he reveals himself to me. Amen. So as you witness to others, accept the fact that people need time to think through this. We rush this thing sometimes and it's, we tell people, you got to receive Jesus. You got to have him right now. Give them the information and give them time to understand it because the worst possible thing is to have uh, a, a person who accepts Christ and doesn't understand what he's done. Now, the Bible goes one step further and tells us this. Those who rejected the prophetic word rejected the resurrection. You can't have one without the other. If you refuse the prophetic word, then you have received the word concerning the resurrection. Now, this was the case of the uh, Lazarus and, and the rich man. Notice in Luke chapter 16 and verse uh, 31. If they did not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not listen or not be convinced, even if someone from the dead were to come back. You know, you're going to have to have an opportunity to hear this word and believe it without uh, having someone from the dead to come talk to you about it. Amen. You need a living witness. Amen. So the Bible says this, our minds and hearts will begin to embrace the massive decision of Christ only through the light of scriptures. All of them. The Old Testament talks about his coming and what would happen when he came. The New Testament gives us the story of what happened when he came and as we go through the rest of the uh, New Testament, we find out exactly what he expects from us after he is preparing us for his return. Amen. So it is only Christianity, <clears throat> only Christianity has a God who can become a human and die for his people and be raised again in power. He's raised to rule in his church. Forever. So, in conclusion, let me tell you this. There are so many reasons for the resurrection, but let's give you seven good quick reasons why the resurrection is so important. First, because Christ was raised from the dead, we know that the kingdom of heaven has been broken into, has it broken into earth's history. So our world is now headed for redemption, not disaster, because he lives. Second, because of the resurrection, we know that death has been conquered and we too will be raised from the dead to live with Christ before, because rather, he lives. Number three, the resurrection gives authority to the church to witness in the world. And the Bible teaches us that in the book of Acts, the apostles' most important message was the proclamation of Jesus being raised from the dead. Number four, the resurrection gives meaning to the church's sacrament of the Lord's Supper. When we uh, remember the story of the Emmaus Road incident, that it is in the breaking of bread that we discover the resurrection, uh, raised, resurrected Lord. Now, number five said this. Uh, the power, the resurrection, excuse me, 
helps us to find meaning in a great tragedy. When someone has died, it seems as though all hope is gone. But the resurrection gives us hope for the future that we'll see them again. Number six, the resurrection assures us that Christ is alive and ruling in his kingdom. He's not a legend. He is alive and he is real. Number seven, the power that brought Jesus back from the dead is also available to us so that we can live for him in this evil world. So only one central belief unites and inspires us all. <laughs> Excuse me, Insp inspires all true believers and answers the question, what happened to Jesus? The answer, he rose from the dead and he is alive. Amen.